Okay, so today we're going to discuss the last part of Chapter 10, which is Section 8 through 10, and it involves uh, talking about some more qualitative properties of energy. Okay, so we're going to talk about, um, right now we would say that we are in what's called an energy crisis. It's not about quantity, but it's about quality of energy. Okay, so energy gets concentrated in gasoline, right? We use it in our vehicles. And then as it converts to other forms, such as heat, those concentrated, you know, particles of energy, basically, now spread out to the environment. So even though energy is conserved, and the amount of energy in the gasoline is equal to the amount of heat that it's, you know, transferred to in other forms, such as heat, the quality is not the same. You can't take that heat and collect it and put it back in the gasoline. So when energy is used, the quality, or sometimes we say the ease of use, is lowered. And this, you know, makes it difficult to collect, you know, our non-renewable resources, even though energy is conserved. Petroleum uh, is used at a much faster rate than it can be replaced. And so eventually, you know, we will have a shortage, which is what, you know, there are concerns about that. So some other alternative sources of energy would involve sun, wind, uh, water, things like that. Okay, so let's talk about Section 9, which is how energy relates to us. Okay, so here's some forms of energy that we use. Okay, fossil fuels come from the decay products of plants. It takes a long time to produce these because all those plants have to be um, you know, smushed and under pressure and heat for a long time. Plants are originally produced by the sun in the process of photosynthesis. And so this includes you know, woody plants, coal, petroleum, and natural gas. Those are all fossil fuels produced from plants. So let's look at petroleum and natural gas. These are most likely formed from the remains of marine organisms that lived 500 million years ago. Okay, and so petroleum is a thick, dark liquid composed mostly of what are called hydrocarbons. Hydrocarbons are basically chemical compounds that contain carbon and hydrogen. Carbon is really unique because it can bond with itself to form long chains. And when we say we have like an organic compound, we usually mean something made up of carbon and hydrogen in these really long chains. Not a lot of other elements can do that. And so a type of, um, another form of a fossil fuel is natural gas. This consists mostly of methane, which is CH4. So whereas petroleum contains long carbon chains and must be separated into what are called fractions, which are different lengths of carbon chains um, by boiling, natural gas is just one carbon. Uh, lead was originally added to gasoline in order to help with this, but, um, this destroys catalytic converters, and it's really bad for the environment. So now you'll see that all your gas is unleaded. Okay, coal is another fossil fuel. This is formed from the remains of plants that are buried and then put under really high pressure and really high heat over a very long period of time. So as coal ages, because it's under the ground for longer, the carbon content increases. This increases the quality of the energy. So the more carbon, the more energy. Well, coal is expensive. It can be dangerous to mine. You know, every few years or so we hear about a mine collapse like on the East Coast. Um, in China, they have a lot of coal mines. And so this can be really dangerous because you're we're going down deeper and deeper to try to, to get coal. Um, it also produces air pollution when burned, uh, usually in the form of CO2, but other um, things are given off when coal is burned also. Okay, so let's look at, so because a lot of these fossil fuels produce CO2 as a byproduct. Let's look at how CO2 affects the climate. And what 30% of the sun's energy gets reflected back into space by the Earth's atmosphere. But the other 70% gets absorbed by plants, a lot by the ocean because it's huge, um, soil, rocks, water, things like that. Because it's absorbing this heat, the temperature of Earth's surface is increasing. Okay, and this is through infrared radiation or heat radiation. So the atmosphere, so only 30% escapes, the rest gets trapped and absorbed, okay, and so then the atmosphere traps that heat, and this keeps the Earth warm, and this is why, you know, we're one of the special planets that have this atmosphere that allow uh, living things to survive. Okay, well, some people think of the greenhouse effect as being bad. I mean, we hear about greenhouse gases, but the greenhouse effect is actually what keeps our Earth a place where we can live. Greenhouse, um, a lot, so think about a greenhouse like the one in the Ag Department. Greenhouse allows light to pass in and out, right? Plants can live inside it. It's relatively light in there. 
Okay, but what it doesn't allow to pass in and out as much is infrared. Okay, it keeps it in, which makes the greenhouse really warm, even though it might be cold outside. Well, the atmosphere works the same way. It allows light to come in and out, but the heat from the sun gets trapped. Okay, so we control the temperature of the Earth mainly through CO2 and the water present in the atmosphere. And the amount of water is controlled by the water cycle. We've got a lot of water in the oceans. It heats up, turns to vapor, goes into the clouds. When too much builds up, it rains or snows, comes back down, and we have this cycle. Okay, but the problem with CO2 is that because, you know, we have a more industrialized um, countries and, you know, we're coming using more cars and other things like that, we're producing a lot more CO2. And so CO2 levels are now going up. Okay, and this, because the temperature of the Earth is controlled by CO2, this increase, based on whatever it's coming from, whether you believe it comes from humans or it naturally occurs, wherever you think it's coming from, it does cause the temperature of Earth to rise. And if it's in the climate, it can produce, or if it's in the atmosphere, it can produce changes in the climate. Not just hot temperatures all the time, but more extremes. Okay, so regardless of whether or not you think climate change occurs or you know the greenhouse effect is or the greenhouse effect, global warming is real, CO2 does cause the Earth to warm, regardless of where it's coming from. Okay, so we're just talking about the scientific principles, not, um, you know, the opinion stuff. Okay, so um, a little bit about climate change. Earth has been around, depending on what you believe, for much longer than its climate has actually been studied. And so it's hard to know exactly how CO2 is going to affect the climate, we know that it's involved in, you know, that greenhouse effect, but we don't really know a whole lot past that. Okay, however, we, we can see that CO2 levels are rising from where we started recording data. Now, whether or not that's a cycle is really hard to tell sometimes because we don't have, you know, data from when Earth began. Okay, so whether or not you believe in climate change or um, global warming, it is good to consider other energy sources because we need to be versatile. And so we need to consider the economic, climatic, and supply factors of all energy sources. Okay, so we've got solar. These are really expensive, and they're only, you know, they can only be used in certain locations. Like if you live in the desert, it's probably going to work a lot better than if you live, like, in Michigan, where it's cloudy all winter. And they're also really expensive. Okay, we've got nuclear energy, which is, you know, really efficient, but the problem is, it's really dangerous if it's not handled appropriately. So in Japan, when they had the tsunami and it affected the nuclear reactors, you know, so people are can be very afraid of nuclear energy. We've also got biomass from plants, synthetic energy sources, okay, and all of these involve lots of research. So it takes money, you know, it takes resources, things like that. So we're counting on you to, you know, go get your chemical engineering degree and come up with all this stuff. Okay, let's look at how we use energy as a driving force. Okay, so certain reactions will only occur in a particular direction. Not all, but some. So if you think about a log burning, it's not going to go the opposite direction from bash to log. It can really only go one way with that. Okay, so we take our log or our carbon compound plus oxygen and we produce CO2, water, ashes, and energy. You can feel that energy being given off as heat. Okay, this reaction will never occur in the opposite direction. Okay, and there are two important driving forces that ensure it only goes in one direction. First is energy spread. And we're spreading out the amount of energy. And the other one is matter spread. We're putting it into a lot more products. Okay, so let's look at energy spread. Okay, in a given process, concentrated energy in the log gets dispersed really widely into all these other things and it's spreading out as heat. Okay, and this happens every time in an exothermic process. So when you burn something, this is what's happening. Okay, let's look at matter spread. Molecules of substance spread out when they react to occupy a larger volume. Processes are favored if they involve the spreading out of energy and the spreading out of matter. And so sometimes the processes will occur in reverse, but it's going to be based on is energy spread occurring? Is matter spread occurring? And so those are going to uh, determine which way a reaction goes. So let's look at an example. So if we dissolve salt in water, that's an endothermic process, which means energy is not spreading. And so we'd say, oh, well, this probably won't occur, but we know it does. 
And the reason it does is because matter spread becomes a bigger factor because the NaCl particles dissociate and spread out. And so that overcomes the fact that it's endothermic. Okay, so the favorable matter spread overcomes the unfavorable energy spread. Okay, so let's look at one last factor, which is entropy. Entropy is a measure of disorder or randomness in the universe, and we use the capital S to as the symbol for entropy. So a function, um, it was a function invented to keep track of the natural tendency of the universe to become disordered. So which has more entropy, ice or steam? We've got ice, which is a solid. The particles are very packed. They're not moving very much. We have steam, which is a vapor, lots of energy. The particles are moving around a lot. Yes, we would say that steam is more disorderly. It has more entropy. Okay, and so energy spread and matter spread. So we've got more energy in steam, and the particles are spreading out more, leads to a greater entropy. Okay, and this relates to the second law of thermodynamics. So we already talked about the first law. Second law is the entropy of the universe is always going to increase. Things will be favored that increase entropy. Okay.